Good day everybody and welcome to Christian Living Australia. I am Akrita and today we're going to start with chapter 18 of the book Acts and I'm going to cover the first part which will be where Paul is in Corinth and Abel will do the second part where Paul returns to Antioch and he will just briefly stay in Syria and from there he will go to Israel to Jerusalem and from there he will go to Antioch. I hope you're going to enjoy today's lectures. Um, it's jam-packed um, with a lot of interesting stories and archaeology evidence. May God bless you with our lectures today. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that our sins were judged at the cross and that there is now no condemnation for us because we are in Christ. But we realize that there are many others that remain dead in their sins. We pray that you will use us to tell those that you place in our path that Christ died for their sins, that he was buried and rose again, so that all who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's start our reading today. Acts 18 out of the English Standard Version from verse 1. After this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Paul is in the last half of his second missionary voyage. Corinth is a major city west of Athens on the eastern shore of Achaia. The island-like landmass that attached to the southern Greece via a isthmus. It had a population of around 220 times more than Athens. It was known for Aphrodite Temple with a thousand prostitutes and understandably pervasive sexual licenses. The city's reputation was so connected to sexual sin that the name Corinth was turned into the verb Corinthsumia, which means to fornicate. Fortunately, Paul meets refugees and fellow tent makers Aquila and Priscilla. The couple will become good friends to Paul and powerful missionaries. In Ephesus, they will host the church there and teach Apollos about Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 19 and Acts 18 verse 24 to 28, which Abel will later cover. They will also return to Rome and host the church there. Romans 16 verse 3. It is interesting to note that in the six times the couple is mentioned in the New Testament, Priscilla's name comes first four times. It's not clear why. It may be she was a high social class than her husband. Prisca is more formal, while Priscilla is a nickname. Claudius was emperor from AD 41 to 54. Although the state of the expulsion of the Jews is unknown, Cassius Dio wrote that although Claudius initially didn't mind the Jews and wanted them to practice their own religion, later he expelled them because the numbers grew too great and he didn't want them to organize into an opposition force. That approach sounds like that of a particular Egyptian pharaoh in Exodus 1 verse 8 to 14. Suetonius claimed Claudius evicted the Jews because of the continuing argument about Christus. Unfortunately, no one knows who or what Christus mean, as it was a term often used for good or useful slaves. Gallio was proconsul of Achaia for about two years somewhere between AD 50 and 54 but it's unclear how his terms align with the 18 months Paul is in Corinth. Paul's choice to work and preach has several different reasons. The Jewish school's founder, Hillel, believed a rabbi or scribe should not make money from teaching the Torah. Paul firmly believes otherwise. 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 18. But here, at this specific time, the church in Corinth is somewhat fragile. To keep their attention on the message, he does not ask them to support him financially. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 4 and 6 to 15, even though they do provide support for the church in Jerusalem, 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1 to 3. This contrast with the church in Philippi which provides Paul support even when he isn't with them. Philippians 4 verse 15 Paul's experience in Corinth has given us the term tent making. This means to work full time at a secular job in order to fund one's ministry's work. It usually refers to missionaries who take a job in different countries which is not their own. 
such as many people do and go diff teach different languages in countries that struggle to speak English, for instance. The job allows them to support themselves without burdening those who serve or sponsors back home and to get to know the people they are trying to reach for Jesus in a not threatening environment. Paul's modus operandi when entering a new city is to go to the synagogues on a Sabbath and to wait to be asked to teach. He will then start with the prophets and show how Jesus of Nazareth fulfills the prophecies of the Messiah. His hope is and always was that all the Jews as one body will come to faith in Jesus. Usually, however, only some Jews and a large number of God-fearing Gentiles will believe him. He will get kicked out of the synagogue. He'll find a place outside of the synagogues to teach. A lot of Gentiles will join and the non-believing Jews will harass him until he leaves the city. <clears throat> Paul finds the same cycle here in Corinth. After Silas and Timothy finally arrive, the Jewish leaders in the synagogue harass Paul to the point that he leaves. Fortunately, one of the Gentile God-fearers lives next door and invites Paul to teach from his home. The leader of the synagogue follows. Despite the harassment, God tells Paul he will protect him. Paul and his team stay for a year and a half, building the church in Acts 18, verse 6 to 11. Let's continue our reading from verse 5 to verse 8. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garment and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus, Justus, a worshipper of God, his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians heard Paul believed and were baptized. After Silas and Timothy finally arrive, the Jewish leaders in the synagogue harassed Paul to a point that he left. But fortunately for him, there was a God-fearing Gentile living next door and advised Paul to teach from his home. The leader of the synagogue follows. Despite the harassment, God tells Paul he will protect him. Paul and his team stay for a year and a half, building the church in Acts 18, verse 6 to 11. Paul and his team has been run out of both Thessalonica and Berea by the Jews from Thessalonica. But Paul cared about the church there and sent Timothy back in Acts 17, verse 1 to 14 and 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. Timothy brings good news despite the fact that the unbelieving Jews had dragged some of the Jesus followers to the city's authorities in Acts 17, verse 6 to 9, and continued to persecute them after Paul left. They stand strong in the faith, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 7 to 10. Paul will find the church in Thessalonica and Corinth very different. The Thessalonians' strong faith in spiritual maturity will lead to questions about Christ's return in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, and 5 verse 11. The incredible immoral sexual culture of Corinth will lead Paul to remind them of seemingly obvious boundaries such as not sleeping with their stepmother in 1 Corinthians 5. After the Jews returned from exile in Babylon, Nehemiah travelled to the Jerusalem to encourage them to rebuild the wall around the city. While there, he discovered that the rich were abusing their power and using such unfair business practices that the poor had to sell their children 
into slavery. Nehemia confronted the rich, and they agreed to stop charging interests on loans, and to return the land and home they'd taken. Nehemia 5 1 to 12. Nehemia writes, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor, who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said Amen and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised in Nehemiah 5 verse 13. The, this parallels Jesus' command to the disciples that if a town refused to believe his message, they should shaken of the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And Mark 6 verse 11, as even the dust they walked on was unworthy of Jesus' offer of salvation. The line that they blot will be on their own hands has to do with who is responsible for whatever curse or hardship would fall upon them. Ezekiel the prophet served God in Babylon. God gave him a very difficult message to tell the exiles there, including that they would not return to Jerusalem any time soon and that the temple would be destroyed. In Ezekiel 33, verse 1 to 9, God explains that he chooses prophets to be watchmen for the people to listen to. If the people refuse to listen to the prophets, they will be responsible when God's judgments bring their deaths. If the prophets refuses to share the message of God has given to the people from them, the prophets is responsible. In the case of the Corinthian synagogue, Paul had shared the message of Jesus, commissioned him to do. He felt his responsibility. He is absolved of any liability for those who refuse to believe him. Titius, Justus, as a worshipper of God, is a Gentile. There are three classes of people who worship the Jewish God. Jews are obviously the first, the second is proselytes, Gentiles who fully convert to Judaism, the males accepting circumcision, third are the God-fearers or God-worshippers, Gentiles who follow God and go to synagogues but do not fully convert. The book of Galatians is largely about how Gentile Christians do not have first to become Jews in order for them to become a Christian. Believed in the Lord means that Crispus believed that Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth as a human and died to cover his sins. Crispus believes that Jesus' resurrection proves that God accepts Jesus' sacrifice and that it is Jesus' work, not his own, that will reconcile him to God. Crispus' story provides a testimony against household salvation. The belief that if the head of the house is saved, the rest of the family automatically are, or that if parents are saved, their children are automatically saved as well. When Paul and Silas explain the gospel to the jailer in Philippi, casual reading of the passages suggests if he believes, his household will be saved, in Acts 16, verse 31. There are other passages where the head of the house believes in Christ and the whole family is baptized, in Acts 16, verse 15. Here shows that Crispus and his family members believed. Baptism was not even mentioned here, although later Paul will remind the Corinthians church that Crispus is one of the few people Paul himself baptized in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 14. Let's continue our reading from verse 9 to 11. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, 
but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people, and he stayed here in six months, teaching the word of God among them. This time, however, God wants Paul to stay a while. The people of the church in Corinth will need a lot of guidance. After Paul spends 18 months establishing the church, Apollos will come and build on Paul's foundation later, which Abel will um, share with you. Paul will write four letters to the Corinthians, two of which we have as part of today's preserved scripture. They show that Jesus' followers need a lot of help learning how to live godly lives because the only thing that they knew all of their life is to live in the sinful culture which was very perverted and very sexual. Jesus appears to Paul in a vision several times during his ministry. First, at his conversion on the road to Damascus, Acts 9 verse 5. Then when he returns to Jerusalem, and Acts 22 verse 17 to 18. In Troas, Paul has a vision telling him to go to Macedonia, in Acts 16 verse 9. After his arrest in Jerusalem, Jesus will reassure him that he will go to Rome, in Acts 23 verse 11. We should not accept the same type of interaction with Jesus that Paul experienced. Remember, the beginning years of the church as a message of Jesus' offer of salvation and forgiveness spread required a lot of direct guidance. Now God primarily speaks to us through the Bible because we have all the guidance in there that we need. Let's continue our reading from verse 12 to 13. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuaded people to worship God contrary to the law. The Jews are not satisfied here. They want Paul gone. They want him out. They charge him with persuading people to worship God contrary to their laws. In the Roman Empire, it was illegal to preach a God that was not authorized by the government. In addition, much of the wording used by Jesus' followers, including called Jesus King, was in direct conflict with emperor worship. The proconsul was a ruler of a district that did not need a standing army. He answered to the Roman Senate, not the Emperor. Lucius Junius Galileo was the proconsular governor of Achaia, which included the large island-like area where Corinth was, as well as a thin strip of the land that connected it to the mainland of Greece. Galileo was the brother of Seneca the Younger, the famous Roman Stoic philosopher. And he had a reputation for being very funny and amiable. An inscription shows he governed Achaia in AD 51 and 52. Let's continue our reading from verse 14 to 17. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourself. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and the all-sized Sotinus, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal, but Gallio paid no attention to any of this. The Jewish leaders of the synagogue have brought Paul before the tribunal because they don't like that he has convinced so many Jews and Gentiles that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Their charge is that Paul is persuading people to worship God contrary to their laws. Gegerio, in De La Gibbis, considered it a serious crime to promote the worship of a deity not authorized by the Roman government, or even to worship such a god in private. If Galileo agrees with the Jews, Paul can face serious punishment. Fortunately for Paul, he doesn't. Perhaps it's because Paul is a Jew who began by reasoning with other Jews in the synagogue. Galileo doesn't see a legal difference between what Paul is teaching and what the Jews are affirming. He dismisses these charges and goes on to other business as the hostile synagogue leader is beaten. Sustinus is apparently Crispus' replacement and the head of the group that brings Paul to trial. It's unclear who they all are, presumably Gallio guards who want to make sure the Jews understand not to waste the proconsul's time. In Paul's instructions to his letter to the Corinthian church, he writes, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and our brother Sustinus, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1. There is no way we can know for certain, but it appears the Jewish synagogue leader so irritated with Paul that he brought him before a Roman court eventually becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. If so, there is no doubt Paul thought his tense encounter with Galileo was well worth it. We came to an end of the first part of today's lecture. I really had a lot of fun presenting our findings and our research to you, and I hope God will bless you with um, our lecture today. Stay tuned for Abel, who will present the second part of today's lecture. May God bless you all beyond your expectations. Goodbye. Our scripture reading from Acts 18, verse 8. 18 continues now after this Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila at Sincreae he had cut his hair for he was under a vow welcome viewers and subscribers my name is Abel and I'm taking on over from Margarita to complete the rest of Acts 18 today. Now, we just listened to the audio recording of uh, verses 18, and the um, headline here, it is about Paul's finishing up his second missionary journey, um, where they are going from place to place. We notice there that Priscilla and Aquila were mentioned in the verse, and that the uh, what actually happened here that both of them were evicted by uh, in from Rome by the Emperor Claudius and and apparently they came to Christ in Corinth after Paul uh, joined there tent making business that's where I met they met Christ uh, verse 1 to 3 of, of Acts 18 describes that we see also that Paul leave them in Ephesus uh, verses 24 to 28 give us more information they they will also host the church in Ephesus apparently for, according to 1 Corinthians 16 verse 19 and the last place that we know about them they they return to Roman Rome uh, in Romans 16 verse 3 we find that um, Saint Cray is a uh, eastern port uh, of Corinth and uh, Corinth was in the district of Agaia, which is a large Agaia, which is a a large little island like mass of land that was connected which is connected to Greece still today with Greece mainland by a narrow Ichthmus. Now according to the Google explanation of, of Ichthmus, it is um, a narrow piece of land or strip with sea on both sides of it and it connecting two land masses used land masses it's basically like a like a road road in a, in a river from connecting one place to another places 
that's the basic the basics the, the basics way I can explain it. Uh, Senkrai was uh, on the eastern side of Ichtmus, while uh, its counterpart um, Lik Likion was on the west side. So it was the counterpart Likion was on the west side of the um, of the landmass. Uh, Senkrai and Likion were named after the two sons of Poseidon. Um, Recently, the biblical scholars has discovered that uh, is still unclear about the vow that we read up in verse eighteen that Paul was under. Uh, they would say it probably it was probably a Nazarite vow, and according to the scriptures, the Nazarite vow uh, was a tradition of the Mosaic in the time from the time of the Mosaic law where the Jews were at friend, they refrained from alcohol and they let the hair grow and they also dedicated themselves to a period, intense period of devotion to God according to the book of Numbers chapter 6 verse 1 to 21. Now since Paul uh, took a haircut um, right there, um, right after he left Corinth they reckon it was probably, probably, probably for the work that he did there. Uh, I think it's more so that he can fit in with the, the locals and probably be more easily um, welcomed and um, accepted by the locals and the people in that area. Now, although the text says that he is going to Syria, uh, it actually means Syrian Antioch, the end of the day, he lands up in Caesarea Maritama on the Judean coast and then he goes to Jerusalem from there firstly. The resolution of the Nazareth vow requires actually an offering at the temple as part of the, part of the conditions for the vow. Now, if I can tell you more about the Nazareth, the word Nazareth, the meanings, is uh, consecrated or devoted or untrimmed. Untrimmed. It doesn't have. It has nothing to do with the word Nazareth. There's no relations or connection between Nazareth and Nazareth. Um, we know two main figures in the Bible: John the Baptist and also Samson were Nazarites for for their whole life, and. Um, we can read about uh, for Samson about his life in Judges 13 verse 5. We'll mention that he was a Nazarite and then also John the Baptist. Uh, go to the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 15. Will uh, give us the um, explanation and or indicate there that John the Baptist was called a Nazarite. We listen now to the reading of verses 19 and 20. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. And uh, in here we, we will uh, just look at a bit of a traveling that Paul uh, undergone through Asia Minor. Now, Paul doesn't usually stay very long in a specific in a given town, uh, but it seems here that he is only staying for one day in a place called Ephesus. Now, when he reaches Ephesus, um, we see that he has just enough time for a quick stop over in the synagogue. And he explained there to the people, the Jews, that Jesus is the, of Nazareth, is the Jewish Messiah, uh, according to the scriptures. Um, and we see that Paul promised the people that he will return if it's God's will. And according to uh, biblical research, it, it did happen. He definitely returned. Bible reading of Acts 18, verse 22 and 23. And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, 
He departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. I was we just finished listening to the audio of verses 22 and 23, and Paul and his people is continuing on their missionary journey. Um, the text says that he goes up to, to greet the church. And uh, now this doesn't refer to the church in, Cis in Caesarea, but, it's in, but actually in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about um, 2,600 feet or nowadays 800 meters in elevation, meaning above, above sea level. And Caesarea is at the sea level. So it's basically an uphill of 800 meters. The church, this church is the original church that has been started by the disciples at the day of the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on 3,000 people, according to Acts 2. You can remember Acts 2. And this was pastored by uh, James, which is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, find that in Gal uh, Galatians 2 verse 9. We see that the text doesn't say why Paul goes to Jerusalem. We think he may need to complete the requirements for this uh, Nazarite vow that he is under, according to Acts uh, verses 18, which include also the sacrificing at the temple. Number 6 verse 13 to 20 uh, will explain more about that. Um, we see that although Paul relies on Jesus, Jesus for salvation, he has no problem in participating in Jewish rituals, according to Acts 21, verse 23 to 26. Now, we think that another possibility, they think another possibility, is that he wants to be there for the Passover, or it could be that he uh, has to report how he planted churches uh, in Macedonia and Greece, and also is there to getting new instructions, as the apostles may have for him to, to perform or execute. Uh, read about that in Acts 15 verse 2, and also Galatians 2 verse 1 and verse 2. Now we see that when Paul leaves Jerusalem, um, he will return to Syrian Antioch, which is in a far northeast corner, of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, uh, though after an extended visit there, um, he will set out for his third missionary journey, which started visiting the same places as the second missionary. So they going back to all the churches that they started and um, just checking up and I guess supporting and morally supporting the people in those churches. The uh, new convert, converts to Christianity. Now, this time, however, he has returned to Jerusalem, and we see here that he will be arrested and imprisoned this time. Uh, look in Acts 19 to 28. Uh, but eventually, finally, Paul will reach Rome, which uh, he has been longing for a long time for years to come, he will actually meet, get to Rome and fulfill his journey. Uh, please read in Romans 1 verse 11 to 15. Furthermore, look at Galatia, um, is a large district in the northern day central Turkey of today. And we find that during Paul's first missions, mission, mission journeys, what it was he and Barnabas that planted the churches here in, if you can remember from previous podcasts, uh, from Acts 13, he planted the churches in Persona, in Antioch, uh, Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. And then on his second missionary trip, he had Silas with him, and they returned to the area where they meeting Timothy uh, in Lystra, in Acts 16, verse 1 to 5. He plays called Phrygia, is a small region with the ever-changing borders between Galatia and Asia, which is the large district in the modern-day western Turkey. This place included the cities of Colossia, Laodicea, and Hiriapolis. Uh, this is a few new names that we haven't seen before. Now, when Paul, Paul wrote, wrote his, his letter to the Colossians, 
he hadn't been uh, to this place to any of these cities that will be a, a, a new visit for them Colossians 1 verse 3 to 4 uh, chapter 2 verse 1 and chapter 4 verse 13 give us more information about these places that Paul visited but we will see these places are actually on his way to his main objective namely, namely Ephes Ephesus so on his way there he will have to go through these places and I believe that's what Paul actually did is, um, meeting the Christians there and the Jews and talk to them we listen now to Acts 18, verse 24 to 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an, an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. We just listened to the verses 24 and 26 audio, and we see uh, as mentioned about Apollos and also Priscilla and Aquila. And we listened and hear that Apollos is a Jew from the city of Alexandria uh, on the Egyptian coast. Uh, main characteristics of um, Apollos is he is eloquent, he's a competent in the scriptures, uh, he's fervent and a good, accurate teacher in the scripture, according to Acts 18 verse 24. We see that he come, he come to Ephesus with a full understanding of John the Baptist's call to repentance, according to Mark 1 verse 2 to 8. But unfortunately, he only has a nominal information uh, about Jesus itself. It's no, however, it's not very clear what Paulus doesn't know. But by the time, by this time we know, um, he must know about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, uh, but not about being baptized in Jesus' name. That would indicate that he is somewhere between repentance and uh, John's preaching in Mark 1 verse 4, and the comprehensive uh, forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to God that Jesus provides. We think that the, the biblical scholars reckon that he must know Jesus is the Messiah because that's what uh, John preached in his book, uh, John 1 verse 92 34. But he probably doesn't realize how big a break it is for the Jewish follow, Jesus followers that they have to make uh, from Judaism to Christianity. And I believe even in today's uh, time for any person breaking away, leaving their culture or their faith to come to Christianity is a huge step. It's a lot of sacrifice and only um, an event that the Holy Spirit can can master and the Holy Spirit is absolutely involved in, in take over. Uh, many people lost their lives, many people um, lost their families. Thinking of the Muslims and even the Mormons that, that accept Jesus Christ as a saviour um, have really trouble in with the families, um, shunting them from, from that faith. Um, also back to Apollos, we see that he, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit and seems to share the beliefs with others in Ephesus. Um, Acts 19 verse 1 to 6 tells more about that. Um, when Paulus actually got invited by the synagogue leadership in Ephesus to come and speak to them, we see that Priscilla and Aquila was there at the time. Now, with the lack of some of Apollos' um, experience and knowledge about Jesus, uh, 
immediately what happened was Priscilla and Aquila pulled Apollos aside and they explained to him what John meant when he said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We find that in uh, Luke chapter 3 verse 16. Now Apollos believes and goes on to build up this church which Paul planted in Corinth and made it a very strong and um, Christ-like church according to Acts 18 verse 27 to 28. Acts 18 verse 27 and 28 And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Right, we just listened to verses 27-28. Audio. This is the last two verses of chapter 18, uh, and we continue on with Apollos and also Achaia, new district. Now we know that Apollos is ready to move on and to spread the gospel of the good news, um, the story of Jesus to the people. Now he decides he needs to go to Corinth to continue the work which Paul, Priscilla, and Aquila started over there. Now the church in Corinth was so glad he's there and they welcomed him. Some even tried to convert to turn him into a sect leader, according to 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. Uh, we see that Paul considers him as a fellow worker because of the good work and testimony of the others that uh, Apollos is uh, doing there. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9 tell us more about that. Um, continuing on, Paulus built up those who came to Christ during Paul's 18-month stay, and he continues to try to convince the Jews and the synagogues that Jesus is the Messiah. Very difficult, hard job, but uh, he's, well, he's, he's ready to do it. Acts 18, verses 11 and 28, Achaia province. The brothers there are those um, Jews and, gent and, and Gentile God-fearers, who accepted Jesus as their Savior, either when Paul was there, uh, over there, uh, or through the teaching of uh, Priscilla and Aquila. So we can see that the uh, Jews here had a few leaders, uh, God-fearing men that, that spread the gospel and helped them to convert over to Christianity. Paul was not able to reach all of them in 18 months. And that's where um, Apollos come onto the onto the scene and fulfill and take fill in the gap for uh, Paul there about for these people. Apollos continues to work, in leading the church and trying to reach the Jews who continue to reject their Messiah. Now, right now, Paul knows a little about Apollos, if anything. So soon you will consider. Uh, Apollos as the man, Apollos the man f as his partner in the building of the Corinthian church and I believe they will um, be brothers in Christ working on the same task and building up the churches where they go. Uh, read about that in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6 to 9. And that concludes our lesson for today. Uh, I want to say thank you to all viewers for your participation, for your time listening to us, to me and Margarita. It's wonderful to share the news of um, the gospel to you and how our brothers, our uh, brothers in Christ, uh, Paul and, and Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos and Silas and Timothy and all of them worked and gave their lives for the spreading of the good news and how the Holy Spirit led them from place to place and from synagogue to synagogue. It's just something we can thank God for day by day. That brings that we have a full Bible history of 
the happenings of the and the growth of the Christian Church in that time. If you haven't subscribed or liked uh, or shared yet, I please ask you to share this video with friends and family so we can spread the gospel of the good news as many people as possible. Uh, looking forward to meet you again in, in uh, Acts um, 19, a couple of weeks. Uh, please stay safe and uh, have a good time and shalom.